This case was killer. Great outcome, but a long bumpy road to get there with some pitfalls along the way. Let's talk about what happened, what went wrong, and how we went about correcting it today on The Open Reduction. Welcome to The Open Reduction, the show about everything oral and maxillofacial surgery. I'm Dr. Tom Bolton. Today we're going to talk about an implant case that spiraled out of control, resulting in multiple surgeries and over a year and a half of treatment. Let's discuss what went wrong and how we can avoid ever putting another patient through something like this again. Dental implants are by far the best way to replace missing teeth. The long-term prognosis is excellent and the success rate is extremely high. But they're not foolproof, and this is an extreme example of what can happen when things go wrong. We'll call this patient Lily. She had implants placed at sites 19 and 20 from an outside provider. The surgery didn't go too hot, she had some numbness of the lip and chin afterwards, but unfortunately that was just the start of her problems. A few days after the surgery, she started pouring purulence from the surgical sites. She was placed on antibiotics, but the site still kept draining, so she was placed on two more additional rounds for a total of three weeks. This is where it takes an uglier turn. Lily ends up with a large swelling in her neck and goes to the emergency room. They take a CT scan that reveals a substantial sublingual and submandibular abscess. There's no OMFS at this hospital, so they page ENT. They perform a floor of mouth incision and drainage, and then tell her to go back to her general dentist. At this point, it's been a month of misery for Lily. The dentist who placed the implants finally decides to take them out and places her on more antibiotics. She still has a large swelling in her neck, and at this point, her pain and frustration are at a very, very high level. The dentist doesn't refer her, but Lily seeks out a second provider, and that's when I see her for the first time. Immediately, it's apparent she has a large problem. Her neck is swollen, she's pouring purulence from her mandible, and she just doesn't look good. I mean, she doesn't look healthy. I take a cone beam CT and it shows exactly what I don't want to see, osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis is an infection within the bone itself. It's difficult to treat and requires a multi-team approach. My first surgery is to right the ship. We need to get this infection under control and get Lily out of discomfort. I take her to the hospital and perform an incision and drainage of the left sublingual and submandibular spaces with cultures, debridement and biopsy of the left mandible. I had to remove a substantial portion of the jaw to cure the osteomyelitis. Here's a crosscut of the right side, which is normal, and here's a crosscut of the left side, which is anything but normal. This is so thin that even a mild trauma like falling from standing could result in a jaw fracture, and then we have an even bigger problem on our hands. She spends three days in the hospital, and after the pathology report confirms osteomyelitis, I consult the infectious disease doctors because osteomyelitis requires long-term antibiotic therapy. The infectious disease doctors agree, start a PICC line, and place Lily on six weeks of IV antibiotics. Yup, six weeks. That means Lily has to go two hours every day for six weeks to an infusion center to get the antibiotics. But wait, it gets worse. Due to insurance reasons, the infusion center she has to go to is over an hour away from where she lives. So now every day her and her husband are driving over an hour to get to the infusion center, then sitting there for two hours getting infused and then driving over an hour home. This is basically an all-encompassing full-time job for both of them. You can imagine what they're talking about for an hour in each direction to and from the infusion center. Plus, these antibiotics are heavy hitters, so she's not feeling great during these six weeks. After six weeks of IV antibiotics, she's on oral antibiotics for three additional months. During this time, I'm keeping a close eye to make sure that this infection is resolving and there's no more signs of osteomyelitis. At the end of four months, I'm convinced that the osteomyelitis is resolved and she no longer is losing any bone. But now we've got another problem. She has a large defect in her mandible and she still doesn't have any way to chew in her posterior dentition. This large defect means there's no way to place implants here. There's just no bone to put these implants into, and the inferior alveolar nerve, which is partly recovered from her original surgery, is in the way. So, surgery number two. The only reliable way to get the bone volume we need in this area is with a hip graft, 
So I take her back to the hospital and harvest an anterior iliac crest graft and secure it to her left mandible with screws. The surgery goes well and she's discharged home the next day. It takes six months for the hip graft to integrate with Lily's mandible. So at this point we're at almost a year since her initial surgery. After six months, I take an updated CT and I'm happy with the way everything is looking. Now we're ready, finally, to place new implants at sites 19 and 20. Thankfully, surgery number three can be done in the office under IV sedation. I remove the two bone screws, place implants at sites 19 and 20, bury them, allow three months of osteointegration, and then see her back to uncover them. She then goes to her new dentist to have the crowns placed at sites 19 and 20. So, after nearly a year and a half, Lily does get the results she wants. She has two implants with crowns at sites 19 and 20. But, when you count the original surgery, the incision drainage by the ENT, and my three surgeries, she was operated on five times instead of the usual one. She has partial numbness of her lip and chin from the original implants, a scar on her neck, a scar over her hip, and this essentially derailed her life for over a year and a half. <laughs> Let's recap this case through a radiographic journey. Osteomyelitis can be subtle and difficult to see on a Panorex, which is one reason why having a comb beam CT is a must when placing and managing implants. The debridement doesn't look as bad on the Panorex as it does on the CT, but this is a sizable defect with very thin bone that could easily fracture with a small trauma. After four months of substantial antibiotic therapy, the bone infection is resolved and we can finally begin to restore what was lost. The hip graft is a big procedure, but the results are fantastic. The implants torqued in nicely to the graft, which at this point is part of her mandible. I have the benefit of hindsight, and I wasn't there for the start of this case, but there were a few red flags that could have potentially prevented this from happening. The big mistake that set this whole thing into motion was not realizing how severe the infection was and not removing the implants much, much sooner. Fortunately, infections associated with implants in my office are very uncommon, but they can happen, and the important thing is to recognize them and put out the fire before the whole house burns down. My original CT scan showed perforation of the lingual cortex, which is an easy mistake to make if we're not careful or if the implants are too long. This perforation is the most likely reason bacteria was introduced into the sublingual and submandibular spaces, resulting in the deep neck infection. The implants were also too long and caused damage to her inferior alveolar nerve. Please click the subscribe button, like this video, and check out everything on the channel, oral and maxillofacial surgery. Interesting, great cases just like this one. I'm Dr. Tom Bolton. I'll catch you next time on The Open Reduction.